to granuloma formation and tissue fibrosis um, that causes irreversible damage to these, uh, these tissues. So this is a disease, schistosomiasis, uh, and that's caused by the eggs of the adult parasites. So how do they um, maintain their life cycle um, is they actually switch between two different hosts, uh, definitive mammalian host and an intermediate snail host. And um, they deploy these five different body plans throughout this life cycle, which is tremendously actually amazing biology into it. Um, but um, the, the way they maintain this life cycle is that these, these these adult parasites shown here, this is this big fat one guy, this is the male. And, uh, and this is, there's the groove and the ventral side under which the female sits. So this is the female. And you can see this is the ventral sucker that they attach, they use it to attach to the surface. This is the oral sucker where they feed on blood. And so um, here, the inside the hepatic portal vein, um, they, they they remain paired and they, they live comfortably for decades actually. They lay eggs, hundreds of them daily, which some of them get into uh, host tissue, including liver, causing the schistosomiasis. But some of well, them. I just yeah, want to make sure. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can live for decades. Decades. You know? Yeah. So there was there has been uh, studies of like following up on like human individuals that have traveled and came back and you don't see any other incidents of infection, and you can see parasites in like decades later. So, um, and they're laying eggs continuously, or did they? Yeah, dormant? yeah. So, so they actually lay eggs as long as they're in the, yeah, they as long as they're like paired. And even if they're not paired, some of the parasites actually the females can lay eggs continuously, which. Um, so without fertilization, they can still lay eggs, um, which actually causes the same type of granule. So, um, so these some of these eggs actually get excreted out through urine or feces, and these eggs hatch um, in water uh, into this this uh, creature called Marsidia, which swims around the water to find the inner suitable intermediate host, where they penetrate into the snail tissue, transforming into sporocysts. And sporocysts undergo this asexual reproduction. So you can see they switch between sexual and asexual reproduction, where that means they're actually clonal, clonally amplifying themselves to make more sporocysts that fills up the snail tissue. And from these sporocysts will rise this infectious larvae called cercaria. Uh, so these guys have this tail that they use to swim out from the snail and into, out into the water, and they look for the definitive mammalian host. Uh, and they penetrate through the skin of the, the mammalian host. They lose the tail part. This body transforms into this larval form, schistosomula. And these guys, from the skin, uh, they find their way into the blood vessel. Um, first, they go to the lung and then go to the hepatic portal vein. They start feeding on blood. They, they develop all the necessary organs, including the digestive system and the reproductive system, to be able to mature into adults. And so that's how, and then they actually find their, their pairs, male and female pairs, inside the blood vessel. So it's amazing how they can do this. I'm really interested in understanding some parts of it, um, some of the molecular mechanisms that are regulating, and I'm particularly focusing on this, type, this particular transition of how these cercaria can uh, switch the environment completely into schistosomula, and while and, and then migrating their way into the blood vessel, feeding on blood, growing this hundredfold in size in terms of length, um, while making all the necessary organs, including reproductive organs, and all of these, doing all of these things while surviving through the host immune system, living comfortably for decades. And so, um, this is a tremendous amount of biology in there, and which I'm really interested in, um, but also in terms of medical perspective. I told you about prosequantil, which is targeting this particular adult parasites, but it, um, it doesn't target or kill efficiently these um, juvenile stages or larval forms, which means that if, you, if an individual living in the endemic area, you are constantly exposed to these um, infection um, at which you can't kill with prosopontin. So, so there is urgent need for this um, in the medical perspective um, need to, for an alternative approach to target these parasites as well. So um, 
to begin to study this kind of transitional event, I started looking through this. One other oh, yes. Is there, is there any known benefit to the world from this organism? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Do they serve any? Oh, like <laughs> any utility? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like mosquitoes. All right, other things eat them. <laughs> Not a utility. <laughs> I haven't thought of it that way. <laughs> but I don't. Not aware of it. Yeah. So it's pure evil. <laughs> In my perspective, it's a beautiful biology. But <laughs> they, they give me uh, joy and hope. <laughs> but um, so <laughs> I'm kidding. No. I, know, I know a lot of people are affected by this, and yeah, this is a serious thing. So, so um, taking that back. It's exciting. It's interesting. Oh yeah. Biology. Fascinating. Yeah, so. Uh, so what um, yes. I have a quick question. So, does the circania form uh, reproduce um, in, in, in that form? Because how, how is it able to find its partner? Like, let's yeah. say so, so these guys, um, so these guys can shed hundreds of circaria. Oh, okay. And so, if you have like mixed um, male and female in their sources, they will shed out. Um, Male circaria and female circaria, and if one both get into the same host, they will find their way. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and if you, especially in the endemic area, there's a lot of snails that are affected, and so there's a mix of male and female, and so you have an equal chance of getting um, infected by both. Yeah. yeah. So, to begin to understand some of these processes, I started looking through the whole worm transcriptome, the RNA sequencing data that's available from individual, these each life cycle stages, and assuming that the genes that are important for these transitional events will be upregulated <coughs> um, in these stages, uh, I screened through a couple hundred genes and identified one of the genes called FOXA. So FOXA is a fork head box containing, domain containing transcription factor. Um, and it's involved in uh, endodermal differentiation or gut differentiation in other um, known model organisms like sea elephants. So this seems like a good interest, good interesting target to, to further study. So I first checked the expression of this uh, FOXA mRNA using um, in this, this technique called in situ hybridization. I'm not sure if um, everyone's familiar, but basically you're creating a probe against this, this specific mRNA um, and you can detect that probe where, where the probe is binding to and thereby you, uh, you can tell where the gene is expressed. And so from here, this is the anterior portion of the parasite and this is, you can't really see it, but um, I've highlighted it in this line and you can see there's an anterior region that specifically expresses Fox A. And um, I'll talk more about it later, but um, basically what it seems like when you, um, so this is a double in situ hybridization. This is actually fluorescence in situ hybridization. This is colorimetric, <coughs> as you can see, and you can, for the advantage of double fluorescence in situ, then you can use different uh, fluorescent um, spectra to label uh, specific or multiple um, different genes to see if they co or not. So, um, Fox A is in yellow, so this gene called MEG4. Uh, this is um, a known gene that's expressed in parasites esophageal gland. And so, uh, what, uh, just to orient you guys, this is the anterior part of the head, and then the posterior, and this is the ventral sucker I mentioned. They use it to, to attach to the surface. And in, in between the head and the ventral sucker, there's this esophagus, and then there's the esophageal gland. This gene, uh, this gene like four, is expressed highly, and specifically in the gland. And Fox A seems to be co-localizing with uh, the MEG4 positive cells. So you just think that is expressed there too. And so, uh, what is the esophageal gland? So the the name itself explains a lot, but um, it's. But. Um, Anyway, so, so, so this is a lectin staining, and you can see this part right here highlighted. This is the esophageal gland. Um, so this is a juvenile parasite, and you can, you're looking at the, the mouth and the esophagus, the esophageal gland, and there will be gut branches that are spanning from here, the end of the esophageal gland, to the, the, the posterior end of the parasite. 
And if you look closely, you can actually see these uh, cytoplasmic cell bodies that are, that are, uh, that are projecting out in this, this material into the esophageal lumen. Um, and the EM structure clearly shows that. And what you can also see is some um, immune cells, actually, that are, or the mononuclear leukocytes, um, in, in this case, um, that you can see in this the, the lumen of the esophagus. So all in all, um, this is thought. This organ is thought to be paras the ini initiator of blood pr blood processing because these these again these parasites live inside the postvascular tissue. They feed on blood. They need to process um, immense amount of blood, and so this is the first site that they encounter, or the blood cells encounter, and that they <coughs> probably. Um, digest or clear out um, uh, bl blood cells properly so that they can absorb nutrients and do uh, different things. And so, uh, which is required for parasite development and growth. And so, uh, that's the, that's the, that's the, the model or the hypothesis which haven't been really shown or tested. So, um, now that we know that Cox-A is expressed in this esophageal band, I want to test functionally um, what, what Fox A has a role in this esophageal plan. So um, we can actually perfuse out the, from the hepatic portal vein, uh, different, um, different age of parasites. So we can, when we take out juveniles for three week, three week juveniles um, treat with um, double <coughs> RNA. So, so take, I'll step back. Um, RNAi is, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a way to knock down a certain gene, a specific gene of interest, uh, by feeding this double strand RNA that will be um, in, absorbed in, into the organism and then cut, chopped off into little pieces that will specifically bind to the MR messenger RNA and thereby uh, degrading mRNA that leads to loss of translation. So um, by treating double strand RNA, uh, we can, so another take a step back, you can actually keep the parasites in culture. We have some sort of media that allows these parasites to be maintained, not grow really well, but we be maintained in the media. Um, and during that period, we can treat with double strand RNA against Fox A to get rid of this gene. And we can, this is the feeding scheme, basically, uh, for two, two weeks, we can do that. And uh, we can actually see a pretty specific knockdown of this Fox A, uh, or esophageal band, actually. Uh, so this is, again, Fox-A RNA parasites. Um, you're looking at MEG4, which is the gene I mentioned to you, the esophageal gland marker. And then Cathepsin B is, you can see the gut branch here. Uh, these are the gut, this is the gene that's expressed, known gene to be expressed in the gut branch. And so you can see that's pretty intact, um, whereas this MEG4 positive cells are actually completely gone in Fox-A RNA I parasites. And we can also confirm that with QPCR, um, checking the knockdown level in the Foxy RNAi and also known genes of the esophageal band. So uh, we're pretty certain that the cells are actually disappearing, going away in the absence of Fox A, and that gets rid of the esophageal band in Foxy RNA. So what happens to these parasites in the in the absence of the gland? So um, we actually we can actually do this similar experiment in the adults. Um, by taking out the adults, um, they're pretty mature, pretty long. Um, they, they go about, let's say, six millimeters or so. Uh, and then you put the dose in RNA, uh, knock this gene down, fix it uh, after two weeks. And this is um, some an image of control RNA I versus Fox A RNA I. Um, and they don't, and if you, you can measure the length between these parasites, and there's no significant difference between. Uh, male versions and female versions. And when you actually look under, under the dish during this knockdown period, uh, the par parasites actually remain paired, um, and you can actually see all the eggs that are being laid, laid in the dish, which all, all in all, all of these data suggest that um, these parasites, more so they are, they're, they're, they're healthy they're in, in, in the dish, and they, they don't, they're, don't seem to be affected too much by the loss of the plant. But that's, um, you can assume that that's probably because <coughs> they're in the dish. Um, so uh, one thing we did try, we were interested so that, in. Sorry, uh, yeah, it sort of doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like a major gland. <laughs> yeah. So is it because they're eating all their nutrients somehow? 
by bypassing that gland? And yeah, so, 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 so they actually have um, this structure on the epithelial or outer surface called tenkiment. So this is sort of equivalent to the epithelium in other models, or basically skin, which has an absorptive function um, to absorb nutrients um, through their tenkiment too. Yeah. So they actually have both digestive system, which processes the blood, but also tenkiment that absorbs like glucose and other stuff. So for the, at least for the duration of knockdown, it doesn't seem like the, the parasites are not affected significantly. Um, so I took those same knockdown parasites and then we can do a surgical transplantation. We can open up an, uh, a new mouse and then put these parasites that are lacking esophageal gland back into the mouse and then wait for three weeks, two or three weeks, and then perfuse out these worms. And in the process, we can actually exactly count <coughs> the number of worms that are coming into the, the mouse and then count the number of parasites that are coming out during the perfusion process. So we can quantify the number or percent recovery or number of worms that are recovered um, before and before transplantation and And so um, what, to our um, excitement, uh, we in both cases, uh, this is 15 days post-transplantation, 25 days post-transplantation, you can see there's a significant reduction in the percent of recovery. Again, this is measuring, counting the number of worms that went in and then counting the number of worms that came out after perfusion after this amount of days. And so you see a significant reduction in the number of worms that are recovered. And so where did the parasites go? Um, so this is a control or mouse that received control RNA on parasites. So, so these are healthy male and female going into the naive mouse. They can lay eggs. So you, you see these white dots all here. So these are all the granulomas that are formed in the liver. Uh, during this three-week period. Um, and so this is what you expect to see with the control RNA. What we saw in the FOXA RNA is that the liver looked pretty clean, very, very <coughs> clean compared to the, the control mouse. Uh, but there were these spots that are big blobs. And, we, and you, when you actually take a look at um, more closely, these are actually dead worms. So what that means is parasites uh, that are lacking the gland went into the mouse and they um, they somehow, we don't know how yet, but they died and then they got sucked into the liver and this they, they're just sitting there in a dead, dead body. So um, where are the worms put in again? So, so we opened the mouse and there's this this particular vein that's, that's big enough in the cecum uh, and then we go in there uh, and then inject uh, into, the into the bloodstream. So any questions so far? So um, how are then parasites affected by the absence of the gland um, is a, a, the next obvious question. And I, I, I alluded to you earlier that there were um, these mononuclear leukocytes that are detected in this the esoph esophagus lumen um, here. Um, and if you look at the EM, you see different kinds of um, immune cells um, that, you can, you can, that can be observed. So, one possibility was to test out similarly using um, a mouse IgG. So this is a labeling all the IgG components or IgG um, where the IgG is um, uh, in in the worm uh, or in, from that are coming from the mouse. And what you can see in the control RNA, uh, this is again the esophageal gland, and you can see some sort of IgG positive either cells or antibodies or um, source of some sort of components that are sitting there, um, but you actually don't see them in the same location. You're missing the gland, and you're also missing that kind of components. And instead, what you see is there's an accumulation of this uh, aggregates of big IgG blobs. But, uh, we are not sure what these are. Um, these might be the antibody is causing the aggregation of different um, stuff that are being ingested. Um, we're, we're unclear at this point. Uh, but this is uh, perhaps causing these parasites to uh, accumulate damage and or for the, destroy the tissue of this parasite, causing the death. So we want to test this further. Uh, well, how can we test that? Uh, so 
I'm not an immunologist, um, obviously based on how I'm speaking right now, but you can see, uh, you, we all know that there's the innate immunity and additive immunity, and so we can do the same experiments now um, in this kind of um, immunodeficient mice. So what that means is that uh, there's a specific knockout mouse uh, that lacks this gene called RAG1. Uh, RAG1 is a recombination activation gene um, which is required for this immature B cells and T cells to uh, undergo this recombination event to start producing mature B cells and T cells. So um, absence of this gene, I mean, this gene is critical for that, that process of um, maturation of B cells and T cells, which, which um, is required for further um, uh, specification and production of these immune components. And um, uh, so, so basically it's lacking these, this, these components of the, the additive immunity in these mice. So basically we can do the same experiment by knocking the, the FOXA down to get rid of the esophageal gland, trans transplant them um, into now the wild type mice and the RAG1 knockout mice. Um, and so again, uh, this is what we saw in what I showed you earlier, and this is a different batch of experiment where you're uh, wild type mice receiving uh, control parasites, wild type mice receiving FOXA RNA -I parasites, see again the significant reduction in the percent recovery and to our surprise actually so we in the immune deficient mice uh, the control RNAi parasites um, gave about similar percentage of recovery <coughs> that, going back out, um, that received FOXA RNA parasites also showed a similar recovery rate so this really suggests that these parasite death um, that's caused by the lack of esophageal gland is being rescued in this RAG1 knockout, which lacks the additive immune system. So we can actually take this further, and um, there's another strain of mouse um, that's called mu MT, which lacks the mature B cells, but the T cells are present. So um, this is preliminary, but what you can see also here is that in the mu MT knockout mouse that lacks the mature B cells, um, Control mice, you see a recovery. The FOXA RNAi parasites, you also see some sort of higher recovery, although this is just one mouse. So I, I, I have more mice coming, but um, preliminary results um, suggest that uh, this might be true. So this, all in all, these together data suggest that um, it's possible that it's the B cells or the antibodies that are produced by B cells that are responsible for killing the parasites in the absence of esophageal gland. And this might be <coughs> a specific way that these parasites use to um, get rid of or evade the host immune system. So that's a very interesting hypothesis. Um, so I want to really dig deeper further and this is where um, a combination of in vivo and in vitro might work really well. So um, in the future I am hoping to establish some sort of in vitro um, assay conditions for these immune cells or immune components. So this is in the works in the planning stage but basically um, what we can further tease out in order to further tease out what components um, of this B cell or antibodies might be responsible, we can actually do the same experiments, do the transplantation um, into the RAG1 knockout mouse, but then we can also isolate uh, from the infected mice uh, the B cells or antibodies or other immune components that we want to test, um, purify them, and then transfer back into the, in the, into the RAG1 knockout mice that had received these FOXA RNA parasites. And so, would you see a, would you not see a death of these parasites, or would you actually still see the rescue of these parasites? So this is something I am plan this is a planning stage right now. But you can see obviously it takes like like Dave's machine requires a lot of mice um, and uh, a lot of time, and so and 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 we can't really visualize what's happening in these parasites. So um, one really good way I think for for for, to set up, not just for me, but also for the community, 
um, is to actually take out these parasites, treat them with double strand RNA in the microfluidic channel, and then give um, feed into these these channels the B cells or antibodies, other immune components, um, in order to really start monitoring in the live and to in, in the live condition and see what happens to these parasites because we can we can do a lot of stuff with these guys. We can label these guys or differently. So we can do all sorts of things in these kind of conditions. And, and we can also create even um, active or passive flow system that allows these parasites to, uh, or this environment, <coughs> better mimic the in vivo condition. Um, and obviously, this will require less volume of all of the components that we will be using for these kinds. And so um, this is why I am like presenting this all these two and is hoping that will trigger some interest in some of you guys and that um, this is still at the <coughs> planning stage but um, uh, I was able to you know design a prototype for these guys uh, with help of Tony from the core and um, initially well, the material was PDMS based and um, the worms were not attaching so if I like create a flow it would just flush out and so I had to um, use collagen and um, you can see um, these parasites are comfortably in there and they're they're attached to the to, to the surface and uh, they, they're not flushed out by by the flow so so this is promising I think <laughs> and um, I'm really hoping that we uh, some of you guys who might be interested will, will help me and we can work together to to test out these uh, these immune components um, that might be actually responsible for killing these parasites, which actually would mean that these parasites utilize these esophageal gland in a manner that, that gets rid of these immune system. Um, that's a way of their evading their immune system. So um, with that, thank you so much for listening. And I'd like to thank Tracy, um, who did all the that helped me with all the transplantation work, and Gerald um, was also another Shisto uh, researcher. And so, and, and, so, and so, and and thank you all for listening. And I would love to hear your feedback and any thoughts. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, that, that was an awesome story. It was really interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions and a, and a comment. So. Yeah. What do you think it is about the loss of the gland that's then making it more subject to, is, is avoiding that immune evasion that something's happening when you take out that gland? I'm curious if you have any idea what the mechanism is there. So, I mean, we, so that's what I'm really curious, but um, it's, it's hard to imagine. Like, so I, I'm right now testing um, if these absence of gland that are came, that are that these parasites were taken out from the host. Um, are they actually accumulating some sort of damage, like by looking at apoptotic cells? Mm -hmm. If there are apoptos apoptosis in a particular region of the worm, or if is it like throughout the gut, that might suggest that these cells are actually dam damaging the, the digestive system. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Um, and a lot of these parasites are actually very stunted. They're actually regressed in these guys in the absence of land. So that might suggest that um, it could be some sort of feeding de defect, or right? some sort of nutrients that might be required for these parasites to that that's required for to absorb. And in the absence of that, these parasites get sick and die. So that's like some more indirect way of thinking of it. Um, but yeah. I mean, so that, that's why I'm, I'm like really interested to see what happens if you actually like image them mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the channel and see what happens as the parasites receive more immune cells or components. So. Are they silicates? Huh? Are they, do they carry silic acid on the surface of the parasites? They, they carry all sorts of um, um, glycoproteins and like yeah. lipids, a lot of them. I'm so, just wondering if that light sensitivity changes when you remove that gland. That's a good idea. If you, if you yeah, try, yeah. If you try yeah. seeing if there's a difference in staining, because the B cells especially, I mean, they have some of these um, turn off signals are coming from glycobinding proteins. So if you've got changes in some of the cell surface that possibly as it goes through like a developmental stage, it either um, 
opens up different epitopes or changes like what's on its yeah. what's on its surface. Yeah. Whether that could then be removing like a stop signal for the immune system, it's not turning off these cells. It's yeah. have this very basic kind of yeah. self non self kind of kind of mechanism. But it could just be something you know for a few lectins. There's plenty of um, there's plenty of lectins that recognize salic acid. You know probably like, um, yeah. alpha. Two three or alpha two six would be the ones I'd probably I would probably look at um, just to see if there's if there's any any differences. That's a really good suggestion. Yeah, and then in terms of the immune cells, sometimes it could be a good idea to do like more of a mixed population and depletion experiments than just putting them in in isolation because sometimes they don't all function as well in isolation as they do in the right, whole right. immune so cells. So if you like had mix, mix up different mm -hmm. cell types or yeah exactly even if you had like a group of PBMC but you have one where you deplete the B cells it would let you kind of try and I figure see. out if yeah. the if the action is yeah. coming from the B cells but it would just it, they have all the support I and see. the other signals that they that they need but we have a bunch of human um, PBMC blood cells frozen down so if you ever do want some just for some quick experiments to see in your microfluidics just let me know how I can, can give some human PBMC yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we, we routinely get them from That would require um, some sort of iron. Yeah, um, probably yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But we have some in the freezer, so if it's just you want to try a few things in your device. Yeah. Um, and then you could just um I would have probably a <coughs> where you can just pull out the B cells. Just do like an anti C D nineteen or C D twenty pull down and just remove the B cells. So you can remove specifically mm -hmm. cell population and yeah. then Exactly. Yep. So you can have your cells and then your cells minus the B cells if you think that's where the activity is coming from. Yeah. But they may just, I mean, it's also worth putting them in an isolation. But, you know, they may not work as well in isolation. So depletions can be kind of valuable. So that's <coughs> no, really, really interesting.